Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar on the reduction of suspension and expulsion in early childhood programs in Pennsylvania. We're currently in our second round of public comments and we wanted to walk through what we've received to date and we will also show you where you can look at an analysis of the comments that we've received to date. My name is Andrea Algott and I'm a program specialist supervisor in the Office of Child Development and Early Learning. Due to the large volume of lines on the call, we will have everyone muted, but we would love to hear from you either in um, our questions and comments in a chat box, or you can still do written comments and we will show you where during our extended public comment period. This webinar will also be recorded and will be posted where the other things are located right now. The comments for after the webinar ends, and also it's open currently, um, is the RA box that's listed on the slide on your screen, and we're accepting comments until January 18th, 2016. This is our second comment period to date. We had had an open comment period from September to October, and I want to thank everyone for all the comments we received so far. And after this webinar, like I said, if you have more comments or questions that you might not get a chance um, to think about today during the webinar you can always email us at the address um, attached and I would like to introduce our deputy secretary Michelle Figlar that is going to go over um, the announcement thank you I want to start with thanking all of you today for for joining us for this very important call I also want to thank all of you that have provided public comment being here today with you is critically important to us as it is a priority here in the Office of Child Development and Early Learning to ensure that we have stakeholder engagement and stakeholder voice when developing policy that we will implement out of the office. It is our goal to work with you to design policies that can be implemented exceptionally in the communities where you live, where you work, and where you serve children and families. We want to ensure that the policies, as it's rolled out, provide the proper and adequate guidance to ultimately ensure that children and families and providers can help children thrive and grow in the early learning settings where they spend their day. To that end, we will be establishing a stakeholder group and we will look, for, look to you to help us design these policies and this guidance. So this is the beginning of our conversation together. It is a high priority that we work with our stakeholder groups to make sure that we address the needs of children and families and providers who are serving sometimes our most vulnerable children. So thank you today. Thank you for being here with us and thank you for your continued commitment to this work. Okay, um, thank you very much for those comments and for reminding us all how incredibly important this is. I would like now to do a little reminder for folks about why now? Why are we talking about this? What are the things that, that brought all this to the surface? So we're going to start with um, a little bit of, a, of an infogram here, a new way to look at some of these things. The, the data that I am going to show you comes from, um, we have both state, national and state data. Part of them is, it, part of it is from the Gilliam study. Part of it is from the civil rights data collection from the U.S. Department of Education. And as I said before, Walter Gilliam's study on pre-kindergartners left behind. So let's take a look at how big an issue is this really. So nationally, boys are four times more likely to be expelled than girls. At the national level, four-year-olds are 50% more likely to be expelled than three-year-olds. I find that a little bit in I mean, it's all discouraging, but it's encouraging that we give the little guys a break. <laughs> African American children are two times more likely to be expelled than children of European descent. And five and six year olds are three times more likely to be expelled than three year olds. This is where it gets a little bit more disheartening. Now we're on to the Pennsylvania data. 
in Pennsylvania, a, ch a preschool child who was served in a state-funded preschool is three and a third times more likely to be expelled from that preschool than a school-aged child is to be expelled from school. And this, the concerning piece of that also is that programs that are not state supported, that are so, that have therefore fewer resources, have an even higher rate. So this is one of the big reasons that we want to be addressing this. School age African American girls are four times as likely to be suspended than school age girls of European descent in Pennsylvania. And school age African American boys are more than four times as likely to be suspended from school than school age boys of European descent. And school age children with disabilities are almost twice as likely to be suspended as school age children without disabilities. A question that we got when we first were looking at this data was does this include school age childcare or is this strictly schools? Um, I believe this is strictly school data. This is not necessarily school age childcare. And now we will move on to um, more information about what you came to hear. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, along with the U.S. Department of Education, recently released a policy on expulsion and suspension policies in early childhood settings. Octal draft an office-wide announcement that would embrace and support our current practices and relationships, such as early intervention technical assistance in their positive behavior support services, early childhood mental health, Project Launch, OMSAS, the Bureau of Child Behavioral Services, Keystone Stars, Early Learning Standards, and um, our work on family engagement. I want to thank you again so much for your comments and your comments as we move forward um, with our announcement and also with our guidance to the field. What you see on the screen right now is the same information that you had seen in the chat box earlier. If you if it slips away from you, you can always scroll back up on the chat box in order to look at it again. We realize this is a lot of content up there. Unfortunately, this is the address for where to find the draft announcement and to find the summary and analysis of the comments that have been submitted within 2015. So um, if you have not already, you can jot the down so that you're able to access these and or you can they'll remain in the chat box so that you are able to access them. So if you're interested in who has commented so far, this is the information that we have for you. That large orange half of a circle is all of you child care folks out there. Um, nearly 49, about 49 percent, nearly half of the pre of the commenters were child care providers. Uh, just to help you understand this a little bit, this chart sorts by who chose to make comments and also the types of comments. So if one individual or one group made comments on a couple of different topics, they may have been ca counted more than once. For example, one child care provider made a comment about professional development also made a comment about access to resources and made a comment about funding and to safety and environment. So that person was counted multiple times. Um, also, if a person made one or more comments, that group is, if a group made one or more comments, that group is represented by the number of comments made, not by the number of people in the group. We didn't have a way to know how many people that were there. And if a commenter identified herself as being Head Start, pre-K counts and child care, that comment showed up on all three um, groups. So the number of comments indicated here may not exactly match the number of comments that we will report, but it does give you a sense of where are the, where do the people work who chose and, and took the time to make comments. The comments came from 12 different identifiable groups besides a variety of early childhood and early intervention providers and support systems comments also came from behavioral health, medical providers, advocacy groups, and schools. The, and as I already pointed out, nearly half, or 49%, were um, child care providers. The next largest group was early intervention with 
and then there were another four groups that each provided six percent of the comments. Preschool not otherwise separate, not other. Preschool not otherwise specified. So if you're early intervention preschool, that wouldn't be you. You'd be early intervention. Medical, um, CCIS, and Head Start were those other groups. Hi, this is Andrea Algott again. Um, up on your screen is our analysis to date, and this is also posted um, in the chat box. They had put the web email where you can see the comments, how they're broken down, just like this slide. And I'm going to break them down further and tell you some of the things that were under these uh, seven categories. So looking at all the comments we received that Sue um, just went over, we, we did hear uh, 75 individuals. Some were from groups, some were um, specifically individual people, and we have a longer analysis of those. So they, they fell into seven groupings. The first one being professional development. So the biggest comments about professional development is suggestions for what is needed that they were giving, um, people were giving us guidance on things that they think out in the field we could um, maybe as an office help with um, technical training people in the field to get those skills and resources. And another thing that people were concerned about is barriers that people wouldn't have time for things like professional development. Some of the requests that we had received is focused training and ongoing coaching, um, staff being mindful of cultural changes in child care to better provide individualized programming for children with challenging behaviors, guidance and technical assistance to support staff, training in different things like teacher-child interaction therapy, um, PASS, high-quality reflective supervision with ongoing feedback. Um, another one was free and online trainings and evidence-based practices. In the area of concerns was uh, the need for more staff with social work training and also higher retaining qualified motiv and motiv motivated staff. And some of the training hours, some people had questioned some of the training hours and how many training hours would there be. And early childhood professionals, um, professionals might see it as an additional uh, training as a burden. The next grouping of comments came to access of resources. And the majority of the, the comments with access to resources were that they feel that their uh, that the providers need more uh, early intervention, more mental health con um, uh, consultation. They believe that we lack in some local resources and behavioral health professionals. They believe that uh, if the resources are out there, they need to know where the resources are and that they can be readily available. Um, people talked about behavior specialists and also being able to access appropriate services that are already out there and to identify the things that are. The next grouping was timeliness. So even if we have the resources available and we can um, link people to it, some of the comments people were concerned about waiting time for supporting uh, children maybe that are having um, some challenging uh, issues at that point and that they reach out to professionals and that the timelines might not always be met or in their mind that the timelines are too long. And they also am asking for more screening, evaluation, um, and diagnosis. There, they said that sometimes there's a pushback um, from groups and it's hard sometimes to get uh, mental health services and TSS and behavior services um, in terms of timeliness, even if they did uh, reach out to the group. Thank you. Um, the next grouping of comments was everyone's favorite funding. So the concerns were about money and funding, and they fell into categories such as a need for higher per child subsidy payments, a recognition that the cost of high quality care is often beyond the resources of families, the need for funds to pay higher wages to staff to keep um, attract and keep skilled workers, and the need for funds to pay for specialized services. 
In, in addition, we also heard um, the need for higher pay for child care workers in general. Um, the funding, um, systematic lack of fiscal resources in general, that was a more, that wasn't exactly specific, but it, they said across like all of the things in childcare and centers need supports and funding from the state to implement things that we might be asking them to do in the future. And overall that behavioral health services are underfunded. The next grouping of comments came under safety and environment. There was concerns that if a child is having um, a challenge, that it could put the other children and staff in uh, that certain setting in a, in a situation that might become harmful to them. There was talk about ratio issues for, ch for children that elope, uh, children's behaviors that disrupt disrupt learning and create an environment that might not be as positive for other children that are also receiving services. They were also um, worried that, uh, that the child themselves could put themselves in harm's way and that restraints are not reported in child care. And the other thing I think too is they were worrying about safety environment that um, parents don't always reach out and necessarily uh, if they do reach out to them that there's a safety concern they might not they might uh, put the, the other parent on the spot or make the parent that reached out to the child care provider that they were worried that their child was uh, maybe in harm's way that they wouldn't be heard. The next grouping was parent collaboration. And in this theme, it was a lot that um, parents might be um, not willing to seek additional uh, services for their children. And it could be that they're reluctant that the children might be labeled. Um, they might not understand the resources themselves. The parents might be overwhelmed already and sometimes even uh, we've heard that if the service provider does in fact try to um, recommend services or help the parent refer for services that maybe um, for any number of reasons the parents are unable to possibly follow through with those and I and some of it could fall back into a training thing but I listed it here that sometimes um, the, the parents aren't aware that the services are out there. So that could also be, that could actually fall under professional development too and, uh, and uh, teaching our parents the resources that are out there. And the last area was things that we would consider like systematic changes. So it might be, well, it won't, I mean, some of the comments were that people wanted mandated data collection on if we do expel or suspend a child, monitoring and enforcing compliance of the announcement, um, taking the licensing emphasis away from paper paperwork and focusing on quality and support. And there again, that one could have fallen to under professional develop kind of piece too. Improve relationships between all parties involved. Um, Another one for statistics needed to be reviewed on children with disabilities and especially the racial disparity that we had talked about earlier. And uh, talking to parents that, uh, th that sometimes parents remove their child out of the program rather than actually calling it expelling or suspension. And that there was um, a comment that the federal guidance was deeper than the state guidance. And what we would like you to do here, folks, is thinking about these seven categories, please choose your top two and um, respond to what your top two topics are that you think that the state should really take a close look at and try to address. So 49% of you think we need more work with professional development. And 42% access to resources. 42% for access to resources, cool. And now we are to the most interactive part of the day. Time for you to um, submit your questions and comments. And we have with us today the multiple bureau directors. Um, and we will ask questions specific to who you would like to ask a question about or the category you would like to ask a question about. 
this is a big one. This is one of the big questions that I think people are asking all over the nation. And But our question is, what is Octel's plan to address the issues of race in professional development and access to resources? And to answer this question, we have asked Michelle to come up and respond. So this is a great question, and I think this question really serves to why we need to continue this conversation with our stakeholder group. So we know this data is um, national data. We are confident that the data will represent represent itself the same way here in Pennsylvania. So as we work with our stakeholder groups, it's gonna be essential that we work with local communities to really understand the needs of children and families and the people who live in that community. I think we can also draw down some of the national resources that come from the Build Early Learning um, resource uh, toolkit, right? So we know nationally that the Build Early Childhood Collaborative is really diving deep into this into this uh, challenge. So I think we have work to do together to number one, really look at our professional development, do a bit of evaluation of it to say, is it providing providers and families the resources they need? I think we need to look a bit at our TA as well and do some, some evaluation there. I think we need to look at who we are engaging and do we have the right people um, engaged in our process. So going into communities, building off of LICCs, community innovation zones, work that counties are doing to really learn and develop a plan together because we know this is a this is this is a big issue. I hope that addresses it. We don't have it all planned out, but that's why we need to work together. Thank you very much. Um, and we have, we have a question for uh, Dr. Jim Coyle, the Bureau Director for Early Intervention. And the question here is about the state identified measurable results that early intervention is responding to the federal government about. How does this fit a, along with this expulsion and suspension issue? Uh, thank you, Sue. The, uh, the, the state the state systemic improvement plan for Pennsylvania is focusing on two important aspects of child development, uh, social relationships, which includes behavior and also engagement with uh, other children and, and uh, adults, as well as uh, uh, early literacy. So the focus on working more effectively to help children with disabilities uh, develop social and behavioral skills really ties in very nicely with this policy. and. And within early intervention, I feel that the policy supports the work that we're doing. It also sends a message that early intervention is part of a larger service community. EI doesn't make sense if it stands on its own, but when it's part of a network of family support and a, a network of early childhood education, it's gonna be effective. And that philosophy has been part of our work in EI all along to partner with the early childhood community to think about behavior, behavioral practices, and social relationships. I think there's a very strong connection. We're very excited about it. Thank you very just, much. I just said one last thing. The one, one thing that I'm struck by with the original, in the original statement from the federal government is that I see it as a challenge for all aspects of the early child community. Is it pushing early interventionists to work more effectively on social issues and behavior issues to do a better job at identifying kids that need uh, early intervention because of behavior? Absolutely. Is it challenging the early childhood community to think about how it engages kids and families when there are behavior challenges and social challenges? I think it does that too. So our partnership is going to be very important. So, thanks, Sue. Thank you very much. There was a question about why didn't we include um, the systemic areas on the polling question, and I apologize, that was not intentional, and we will count the the, all the comments, even though we have them listed under systemic, we will certainly um, count those with just as much uh, weight as any of the others that was uh, misprint on the slide. Okay, so we have a couple really specific questions. This is Michelle again. So one is, will, will there be an early childhood mental health advisory committee re reconvened. I can share that um, we have really looked to the Early Learning Council and the State Interagency Coordinating Council for the first time those two entities met together 
and actually convened together. As we look at the structure of our Early Learning Council in our state and our agency coordinating council, I can see that there is a place for an Early Childhood Mental Health Committee again. We are really looking at all the committees that, that we have inside of OCDEL and to uh, think about how they can function in the best way possible so that we get good feedback, good, good advisement from the field, and that we're also not drawing, you know, too much on people's time. So uh, to that end, we've actually hired um, Suzanne Morris, who works out of the Pennsylvania Training and Technical Assistance Network right here, to be our Director of External Relations. So I do see a role for uh, early childhood mental health. I think, again, as we come to our next conversation together and we have this um, stakeholder group, I think this is an important part of the logic model of how we get to this place together is, um, you know, could it be establishing a long-term advisory committee? So I think that's, that, is, that is excellent feedback. The second question, which is very specific, is are more TSS services going to be available for safety purposes in classrooms for children who are three and four years years old. So this is a this is a conversation that we have to have as part of this work with our colleagues at um, OMSAS. We have to have increased collaboration and service coordination. We see that work happening out of project launch, so we need to continue that work together. It's really important for us to remember that we are all part of the Pennsylvania Department of Human Services. So again, how do we have um, our colleagues at at OMSAS be a part of this conversation with us so that we can so that we can say here's how TSS services can work to help children and families uh, sustain the placement sustain the setting in the in the best way possible we want children to thrive in the child care settings where the where parents have chose so we need the TSS system to be able to help us with that so that's that one is there another question Tracy actually the next one that and we have Tracy Camp Campanini up here with us um, and I'm going to paraphrase a little bit because um, this one said expulsions are the last resort but the message that this that I'm getting from this is but we need help so the question is what has been considered in regarding in regard to professional development which might include what are there any new initiatives any new pieces rolling out and possibly does that impact any funding so this is Tracy, and what um, I was speaking with Sue about as we were coming up here is um, we are really setting a course now to do a lot more collaborative and intentional integration about what we're um, creating in terms of plans around professional development. We're also exploring how we can modify or create technical assistance that will be um, not only specific to the exclusion suspension um, issue, but also around inclusion, which is another exciting topic that we'll be speaking about in the future. So, you know, um, there are a number of resources and opportunities that we make available, but we recognize that they may not have fulfilled everybody's needs or they may have, have not found out about them on their own. So um, between the regional keys, the Pennsylvania key, early intervention technical assistance, and the bureau directors at Octel, we are looking to identify what is an appropriate um, professional development offering over the next cycle. And so it's hard to believe that we're in January already. We're making our plans now for what we'll have the opportunity to make available over the summer, and then what will we have the ability to incorporate into the ongoing plans for 2016-17, which seems incredible to be talking about that. And for me to piggyback just a little bit on what Dr. Coyle said earlier is we also, as part of our um, work around social emotional development, are planning on some, some things related to coaching and supporting staff from on the, that's an early intervention initiative, but that those resources will be available for coaches across Octel services. So uh, while we're here, this is great because we have people manning the computers and running up with questions while we're standing around. <laughs> so the next question that came in was, please provide more detail about race disproportionality as addressed in build, and what pieces does Octel feel are most effective and likely to adopt? So this is really, really interesting. Um, Pennsylvania is, of course, a build state for those of you that don't um, have that understanding. 
and it's really um, a great position to be in because of their ability to provide us with additional supports as participating in that system. So um, I'm speaking for myself now as a participant in many of those conversations that until only recently for me and, and the work that I've been doing, we were so incredibly focused on socioeconomic status around looking at poverty that we didn't actually um, focus as much of our attention on their race disproportionality. And so we are looking to see what we might be able to avail ourselves in and technical assistance across all of the work that we do to make sure that we're reflecting that um, race and it fits into one of the things that we, we've done before with the Annie E. Casey Foundation, Race Matters, which is another resource that we have here. So it's an opportunity moving forward when we talk about equality and the difference between the terminology equality and equity, which we, if we had the graphic, is a great graphic. But it's something that, at least in my terms of being um, part of the leadership team, I had not previously focused um, uh, strongly on before. But we have the opportunity moving forward now that we're looking at data and trying to understand understand the climate in Pennsylvania about how to do that appropriately. So that's um, a long-winded way for me to say until recently that has not been my focus, but it is certainly our focus as we um, consider how we're moving forward in the future. Couple of questions for you. So if children are referred to early intervention and they are not eligible for early intervention, can EI teams still provide additional resources and supports? And the second one, same kind of thing. If a child fails a social-emotional screening, is the intermediate unit responsible for a follow-up eval in that area? So it sounds like we have a provider and, an, and a, like an early childhood right. side and an early intervention side yeah. question here. Thank you, Sue. Uh, first, let me say that if a child is referred to early intervention and found not to be uh, eligible, the infant toddler or the preschool or the intervention program can certainly refer them to other resources and absolutely should do so. And should be referring them to other resources no matter what the outcome of the screening and evaluation is. And I'm interested in making sure that early interventionists have a more complete understanding of the network of services that are available for our families and are better connected to that community of services as well. So that will absolutely be part of what we, we look at. In general, a lot of the improvements that we can make that will help uh, families and help deal with social behavioral issues are going to help uh, in broader ways as well, improving the communication and the support that we give to our families. On the second question about screening and follow-up, uh, it was posed as an IU question, but the, the, um, uh, the, the suspension and expulsion announcement deals with children birth through five, so this would affect uh, infant toddler as well as preschool uh, evaluators. Uh, I don't want to get into the technical aspects of the screening process or the evaluation process today, but screenings need to be effective, evaluations need to be effective and complete. So it's important that evaluations take a good look at the needs of the kids that we uh, we assess and make sure that we have an understanding of their social and emotional needs. And that is something that we can look at as part of our improvement in this area. Uh, and I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. And another reminder that if you aren't asking a question today or something comes up after, you can always send your comments and questions to uh, the RA account that's listed on your screen. And that'll be open until January 18th, 2016. Here's a comment um, about what some other folks have managed to do out in their experience. So in their county, they had re obtained funds from their local, and I hear, here's an, here's an acronym, I'm not sure. It, it's M-H-I-D-E-A offices, so sounds like mental health something, but I'm not sure what. Adding child care centers to fund services through school-based mental health services. That it, So they're wondering, having that being supported by school district currently, is that a possibility? And I think what we're looking at here is some of the school-based mental health options. And actually in Pennsylvania right now, we have a couple of OMSAS grants that are working on exactly this issue. There is the Safe Schools Healthy Students Grant that is an early childhood through on up, actually, I think, um, grant. And we, that's being piloted in three 
locations in the state with an expectation that the practices that they find to be effective will be rolled out and extended into other areas across the state. We also have Project Launch, which Octel is quite involved. And that speak that project it stands for linking across unmet children's health needs. No, needs of children's health, something unmet needs in children's health. I knew it had to spell the word. The the but that is also an early childhood through grade three initiative and um, is focusing very strongly in Allegheny County right now. It is a pilot project, again, with the idea of identifying practices that are effective in supporting children who have needs that are currently going unmet and looking to be able to spread some of those effective strategies that they come up with at the local level across other communities across Pennsylvania. So one of the questions that's come to us is, when does opt -out expect to have a final policy in place? And our goal is to have a final policy in place by the March policy forum. So that means there's work to be done between January and March. What's the date of the policy forum? Uh, 15th, 15th, 15th. March 15th and 16th to bring together the stakeholder group. So it, it's um, it's important that a lot of the questions that are, are coming in or, or comments are things that we're considering as part of the public comment. So we don't have the answer yet because we want to take the public comment, look at all of the public com add this to the public comment, and consider those comments as we roll out the, um, the um, announcement. So there's a specific one. So what are Opdel's plans for ensuring that pre-K children and families have access to due process rights? Will these be included in the announcement? Great, that's a great public comment that we will, we will definitely consider as we put the announcement together. So that's a great public comment. And um, you'll see that, an, an answer to that in the, in the announcement. So thank you for adding that public comment. So some of these we may not answer at the moment because we're considering, considering this part of the public comment period. Anything else for me while I'm here? We're, we're literally all moving around the room. It's kind of fun to watch. <laughs> oh, there, there is one really great public comment that I will point out is that we should remember uh, school age children in childcare as well. So that's an important public comment that will be documented as well, as all of these comments will be documented as formal public comment. Related to that topic, one of the things we really haven't talked about but definitely fits with this piece is the cross-systems work that Pennsylvania has been doing for a number of years on program-wide and school-wide positive behavior supports. And one of the things that we would really love to see grow um, that really impacts the school-age child care is the partnerships, particularly when child care is being provided before and after school in the school and the school is implementing school-wide positive behavior support, we would really like to strengthen those relationships and make sure that those um, effective practices are being used through the child care hours as well as during the school hours. Okay, um, we just, um, Octil just wanted to thank everyone for their participation uh, before the webinar, during the webinar, and I'm sure with our partnership after the webinar. Mm -hmm. And I just want to reiterate again, if there's something that we missed or something that you thought of afterwards, please just send it to the RA box listed. And um, just to reiterate what Michelle just said, these will be uh, further analyzed and will be added to the public comments. So if it's it's a comment, we are taking those too, and you can certainly send those to the RA box. And I just want to thank you to everyone who participated today. Thank you.